Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and I am so happy to welcome you to this third talk in James Stewart's series, Who is a Citizen? Our Nation's First Racial Reckoning, 1865 to 1924. Today's topic is Black People Lose Their Citizenship, Red People Lose Everything, 1876 to 1924. James Stewart is Professor Emeritus of History at McAllister and an eminent scholar of the abolitionist movement. Today's Tuesday Scholar program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota and the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Library. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Jim Stewart, on the topic, Racial Reckoning Part 3, Black People Lose Their Citizenship, Red People Lose Everything, 1876 to 1924. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I don't see you. <laughs> I wish I did. Uh, but I hope you see me, and I hope you can hear me OK. Uh, there are a number of things that I would like to be able to get off just as business be uh, housekeeping before we go into what we want to talk about today. Uh, Judy, I want you to cut me off at the end of an hour, no matter where I am. I wasn't happy, and I don't think a lot of other okay. people were <laughs> with the time allotted for questions. And I felt badly about that afterwards. I overtalked quite a bit. And so please stop me. That's Housekeeping, right. point one. <clears throat> housekeeping point two, I do swallow the end of my sentences. Uh, somebody mentioned that to me. I've been practicing in, while well, I've been taking showers, trying to get more <laughs> projection into my voice there in the bathroom. I feel like I've learned a little bit, but if you can't hear what I'm talking about, you have to let me know because it's a habit that I lapse into and need to do better with. Okay, now, what else this morning? Yeah, uh, another piece of uh, housekeeping. Uh, this is something that is uh, very timely and I hope that I can be helpful. Uh, right now, just today or yesterday, a bill was introduced in the Minnesota State Legislature to make teachers in public schools share their syllabuses with parents just to make sure that nothing nasty gets taught, like the kind of stuff we're working on. I think that we can all uh, identify for ourselves the really heavy grassroots pressure that uh, people who don't believe that this history is worth it are putting on local officials, school board officials, and everybody uh, to try and sanitize what we're talking about. Uh, my job in life <laughs> right now is to oppose all that. And I know a lot of other people who are opposing it with me. And if in one way or another you have problems in your school district, if there are things that you would like to be able to bring to the attention of people who are working on this issue, uh, please just email me. Uh, I also am someone who goes out and talks to people about this problem. And I do it for free. So if you are interested in try to work through some of this outside of the context of just these videos, then uh, that would be a perfectly good thing for me to do. And so all you have to do, you have my email address, stuart at mcallister.edu. And here we go, full screen. Oof, how do, I get a, how do I get a big picture of myself here, Judy? I've got this little teeny picture of myself and I can't even see what I'm doing. Are you there? No, Judy's not there. Okay, I have to blunder along. Uh, Jim, if you yeah. go in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click on view, yeah, and instead of, at. okay, now click on speaker rather than gallery, and that should do it. Okay, fine. Um, you know, I don't like looking at myself up close, but I also don't really want to be so far removed from you guys that nobody sees anybody. So here I am, uh, need a haircut. I've been thinking a lot about, uh, going through the videos myself, thinking about how to package them, how to repackage them, how to work them into something that turns into a presentation that's just not a repeat of the videos. 
And as you can tell, I'm assuming that you watch these things. Uh, maybe it's a bad assumption for some people, but you're forgiven no matter what. My job is to try and find a middle ground that works real well for people who haven't found the time to be able to look at these videos and the people who have been able to find the time. Both groups have to be able to try to understand what we're doing here. And uh, bluntly, that's a challenge. So uh, if you have difficulty, this is one of the reasons why I'm trying to spend as much time as possible uh, with questions and answers. Okay. Uh, the topics that we deal with today have heavily a lot to do with the media. There's a video where I spent a lot of time talking about how newspaper headlines talk to each other at one point. We start the videos with a big consideration of Gone with the Wind, a film, newspaper, film. <clears throat> Part of that consideration is a comparison and contrast with another epic film that we've talked about some already, uh, which is Birth of a Nation. So we can see media playing a bigger and bigger role in the whole fabric of how white supremacy works. We've talked about the law of gravity in a lot of different ways in terms of attitudes, in terms of practices, and uh, the law of gravity is my substitute term for uh, um, heavy white supremacy that isn't necessarily about abusing people, but simply marginalizing them and then some other people abusing them. So right now we're in a period of time after the Civil War and it comes more and more into our time where the media tells us or invites us to believe what they're telling you. Okay, and as you know, we live in an age where no one trusts anybody else's sources, and we all live in these hermetically sealed worlds of affirmation. And that wasn't the case back in this early period of time. When you saw news, it was new. <laughs> you hadn't heard it before. The way that media worked back then, uh, in the newspaper is something that got very heavily transformed by the telegraph system, by telegraphy, by the ability of telegraphers and uh, recording, uh, uh, what would you call them, court reporters and, re and recorders, that kind of stuff, to be able to render actual texts of what people said without having to type them all out all over again. And set it in type. Newspapers, I think, as I suggested to you already, are very big in this period of time. Uh, much more print heavy than the New York Times would be or the Wall Street Journal, and larger, more columns, and big, big pictures that go with them. Uh, in our current newspapers today, we're featuring pictures more and text less, because that's a good mimicry of how people are working on an electronic media. But back then, as you've seen with the Thomas Nash cartoons, I hope, the visuals that you get are highly detailed, seem very, very, very either politically potent if it's a cartoon or real if it's a presentation of something that happened. So when you pick up your paper in the newspaper in the morning, uh, you're picking up something of very great substance. It's made out of rag paper. It's not made out of the kind of paper that we have from paper pulp at all. It's the kind of newspaper that if you crush it, turn it into a ball, it springs back. <laughs> it's got a life expectancy that's a lot longer than a regular newspaper today because people share them. People pass them around. You'll find people passing them around in neighborhoods, in barbershops, in grocery stores. People want to know the news because the news is really new. It used to take a long time for something that happened at point A down here in one corner of the Republic to get reported at all at point B at the opposite end of or a long ways away from point A. And the news was basically pretty brief. But now we can fill columns. And now we have a readership that really loves to read. I know that's hard for you to figure out nowadays because we've become really in print terms a lot less literate than we used to be. Uh, you can compare that also with handwriting. I can go on, on, on why 
this age that we're living in now is a age that's print filled and a media revolution in and of itself. And that has a lot to do with how race gets represented. And that's what I'm gonna try and package these videos around today, if I can. Now, what happens in these videos is that first of all, uh, I think I have this right. We've already discussed a film called Birth of a Nation. I hope that's right. That that's a film that was the first major feature film ever made anywhere. And it's really long and it's really revolutionary and it made the claim, I'll just repeat it if I've said it before, that what you're about to see really happened. What you're about to see is a complete replay of what really happened. You can be almost there at the original event through this film. In a way, <clears throat> it makes a claim of a newsreel a lot more than it does a claim of a motion picture that has a plot. Abraham Lincoln is represented as Abraham Lincoln. Thaddeus Stevens is represented as Thaddeus Stevens. Uh, historical characters filter in and out. Pieces of uh, film are reserved for placards that tell you historical facts and then show them on the film. You really believe that you're seeing the Klan in action. It's an invitation, as Woodrow Wilson said, and I think I quoted this before, to see history written with lightning. And this film goes all over the country and you know all about it even if you haven't seen it. I don't recommend that you do anything more than take a few minutes to see some outtakes from it because uh, it's really long and it's really... But the idea in the film, it does have a plot. And this is a plot that's going to dominate Americans' understanding of their past for the next three generations. Okay. And that story is the same story as in Gone with the Wind, although Gone with the Wind is not a film that's telling you that it's about facts. It's not about facts, it's about melodrama. It's about romance. It's about losing yourself in the film. It's about identifying with the characters. It's uh, feeling deeply that Scarlet is in desperate shape or that John, uh, whatever his name is. Ah, why can't I remember who the male lead in Gone with the Wind is. Anyway, that he's a cat or something like that. The actual plot of the film, the, these two films, is the same. It's the idea of a tremendous separation of the American family. American citizens just exploded each other. And it's all done over this problem of slavery. And the problem of slavery tears families apart, tears the nation apart. And the whole point of both narratives, even though one wants to be a, um, a newsreel and the other one wants to be a melodrama, is with the idea that in, <laughs> yeah, Rhett Butler, <laughs> right, exactly. Thank you. Um, geez. The point is in both films that the idea is that this great trauma has happened. We've been through this horrible turmoil that's cost hundreds of thousands of lives and released 4 million people that we don't like very much uh, into the body politic. And somehow the nation has to bind up its wounds. I keep quoting Lincoln about this because he talks about binding up the nation's wounds. Well, the plot in both stories follows an opening scene where family is family and people are together and having a good time. That's what terror is all about. It's all about balls and <laughs> cotillions and gentlemen and stuff like that. And going with it, uh, Birth of a Nation is all about a family also from North and South that lives in harmony with one another. The war explodes them, turns them into enemies, turns them into alienated people, turns them into a time of tremendous turmoil and suffering, <clears throat> which has to end with a family. And Birth of a Nation title, as I've suggested already, is a metaphor for making the nation come together as a brand new nation, synchronous with, right? Connected simultaneously with, and caused by the birth of the Ku Klux Klan, which is called the Invisible Empire. Okay. And the rebirth of the United States is really what you're seeing in 
um, birth of a nation, where black people are thrown out of office, harried out of their homes, the Klan terrorizes them, and then the family comes back to you, North and South, over the, over the well, sometimes the dead bodies of African descended people. It's not that violent, it's not that awful, it's not that terrible in one as a man. And Hattie McDaniel, who plays the loyal servant, is a perfect example of a <laughs> one of the better roles that you can play if you're a black actor uh, during this period of time. But the whole idea there is to save Tara and restore it again. And to have peace come and harmony come. There's no hard racism. Um, ooh, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do with that. Um, maybe somebody can help. I don't seem, to, okay, uh, back where I was. Black people are not seen as the monsters and horrible people that they were in Birth of a Nation. But again, white peace is made with the idea of reconciliation and with the idea that we've remade the nation over again. One is a fantasy, one is a docudrama, and both are profoundly racist and both are profoundly popular. Both make a lot of money. And they are both pioneering films in American cinema, cinematography and cinema history. And both are stridently boycotted by African-American activists all over the United States. <clears throat> so the power of the media has a lot to do with what we're doing here. And we cast that back to some of the earlier videos that you saw, where you know you walk around and you see African American knickknacks, bric-a-brac, stuff, little dolls, figurines, all racist. And when you think about Amos and Andy and some of the other things we showed, what we're showing here is a big giant atmosphere of cultural domination and marginalization. You have to put all the different pieces together in order to be able to see clearly what otherwise is invisible, which is what I keep calling the law of gravity, or another way to think about it, this is something I checked out with African-American people, so I think I'm doing right here, um, is that what we're describing here with this ubiquitous film, news, all this kind of stuff, bric-a-brac, things like that. It's a white noise. It's there all the time. You always know what's going on. Even if you don't see it with your eyes, you can close your eyes and you can imagine it going on all over the country. Now, this is not a very what, <laughs> pleasant way to live. And it's not a very normal way to be normal. I'm trying to get beyond the videos a little bit here and to get into what, what the more profound implications are when it comes to these questions of white supremacy and what it means. The supremacy of all of this media stuff doesn't have some big guy in the back room pulling strings like the Wizard of Oz. It's suffused all the way through the culture. It's everywhere. And the net effect of all of that on people who have to deal with it all the time is to ask the question, and this is a question that gets asked all the time by African-American people, what did we do to deserve this? <laughs> and the honest answer to that question is nothing. Okay. Uh, I'm laughing because I just want to make the moment as light as I can because the point is so, so serious. And you can move beyond what I'm talking about here now to thinking what it would have been like if you were, uh, who do I want to get? Hmm. Why am I forgetting who she is? Uh, I'm sorry, I have these moments and they're just awful. Okay, let's do it in the abstract. Let's assume that you were born in 1862 and you're an African-American person. Your birth date coincides still with slavery. You die, let's see, we'll start in 1862. In 1862. You die in 1931, making you 69 years old, okay? Your mother and father remember slavery. We're talking about not one generation of American people, 
one generation older. Mother and father tell you all about enslavement. You grow up with Reconstruction as a child. <clears throat> By the time you are, I did the math right, 1876, you're a teenager. And we're spending a lot of time in 1860s. 1876, 77, a time of tremendous violence. By the time you're a teenager, you know all about the Ku Klux Klan. You know all about lynching. You know all about the efforts being made of African American people to assert their citizenship and reconstruction, the stuff we talked about last time. And you know also all about this theme about <laughs> we've abolished the slave, but the master remains. You're a Southern. Let's say you're born in Tennessee. And um, you, at this point, know all kinds of different things about sharecropping because the likelihood is that's what your parents are, is sharecroppers. There's a video about that. I'll try and explain it a little bit more. Ida B. Wells, thank you. Ida B. Wells, thank you, Judy. This Actually, the dates are Ida B. Wells. She is the great journalist crusader media again who goes and investigates lynchings all over the South and all other forms of discrimination and writes about them constantly in the Chicago Defender, which is the biggest, baddest, bestest African-American newspaper uh, in the country at that time. There are a bunch of other ones. But now we're talking about the black media and the response to all of this. So what Ida B. Wells has to absorb is all this white noise all the time, then makes the decision to put her nose directly into it and to expose it to other people. Most people can't do that. And that's why she got a posthumous Pulitzer Prize back a few years ago. The point I'm trying to raise is this deeper question of the impact of the atmospherics of both what's on the ground and you live day to day and what you hear and what you see and what's mediated and filtered through the brain, which I keep calling this law of gravity. Now, <clears throat> again, I'm trying to get beneath the video, so not try to go there very much, uh, is a big, big question. And it's a question that's been talked about and written about and spoken about forever. And I'm going to do this through a play rather than try and talk about it in a very direct way. Um, I'm thinking of August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Plays is played all over the country. It's a movie, it's a lot of different things. A lot of you may not have seen it, which is fine. But it's a movie in which there are two characters that are in a jazz band and they support this African American singer who's a great blues singer and has really strong personality. And the play revolves around her and the band members' relationships with each other. Two guys are really close one is the drummer and the other is the trumpeter. The trumpeter, all the way through, has moments where he it has tremendous outbursts of revelation about how a member of his family was launched. He talks about it. He talks about its impact on the rest of the family, all that. He's very volatile. He's very much somebody who believes deeply in what he's doing, throws himself into everything. His best friend, the drummer, is a steady guy who can measure things easily and keep up with stuff and keep everybody else organized. It's really interesting the way that August Wilson uh, apportions the instruments together with the personalities of the people that he's trying to present. At the very end of the play, the play ends, now remember these two guys are best friends, with the drummer pulling out a gun and putting it directly to the head and the of his best friend in a moment of rage and pulling the trigger. The play ends there. What's August Wilson trying to talk about? He's trying to talk about undifferentiated, unmitigated, unmediated rage, anger. A response that people have talked about with black, of, as stereotypes of African American people and as realities of African American people since day one. African-American women speak out, they're hysterical. The way that you pacify George Floyd is by talking about chronic hyperactivity 
a, I don't have the term right, but the fact is that somehow he worked himself into a stage, this is what the police said, it's not true, where he became a energized monster man who needed everybody to put him down. There's always a black savage in the middle of what we're talking about here. And it's complicated, it's deep, and there's a lot of reasons that it shows up. But that's what's underneath a lot of this media stuff. And it's also what the talkback's about. The talkback is all involved. Excited delirium. Thank you so much. Excited delirium means that you have become an over-muscled powerhouse monster because you've lost your wit and your ability to do anything other than feel and act rage. That's what George Floyd was talking about. Is. What we have going on here is people being asked decade after decade, generation after generation, the whole time that Ida B. Wells is alive to absorb this stuff. Now, this isn't the usual kind of thing that white people talk about. But I'm gonna because I'm gonna let the lectures, uh, the, the uh, videos to a certain extent speak for themselves. And the way that it works itself out, this is, this is what seems to be the most important part of the whole media business, because this is an exchange. It's talking and talking back. I've given you lots of examples of the white noise. The black response is in every form of art and athletics and accomplishment and achievement in the whole way that African-Americans have come to dominate so much of American culture and American imagination. The Super Bowl halftime show, the Super Bowl halftime show had all of these rappers. <laughs> okay, uh, My favorite is Snoop Dogg, but you might like Dr. Dre or you may not care about any. But here is the NFL, which is right now going into a giant monster case of white supremacy and uh, uh, job discrimination by a former NFL black football coach but that has been accused of white supremacy forever and ever and ever and ever and documented all over the place in order to be able to take pressure off themselves. Cardi B shows up and suddenly the whole halftime show is nothing but an expression of black rap. What's the NFL trying to do? They're trying to take the talk back and own it so that they can say that they are participating on the right side of what they're really on the wrong side of. I'm doing this now because I'm trying to really emphasize how much the media and politics of all this come together. Rap began as anger. Rap began as a street talk back. This is in the 80s. If you go back and listen to it, it's vulgar, it's nasty. It's full of references to all kinds of things that you don't want to hear about. It's all a message back to one's own community and to the world about what it feels like to walk around with a white noise. The idea of somehow gaining respect of one kind or another. How do you gain respect? Well, we all want it. We all need it. We think. We hope. Uh, yeah, I guess we do. And if all the general channels of respectability are blocked off to you, which for the most of this big mess of American history they are, where do you find the opportunities? In the places where you can improvise, in the places where you can practice your own craft, in places where you can practice that craft with other people like you who understand why this works this way. What am I describing? I'm describing music, I'm describing theater, I'm describing sports. And so what goes on when we think about newspapers way back in the 1870s and 1880s is the place where white supremacy begins to really become a day-to-day -day thing that you can pick up in objects other than other people. It gets you to brick brick a brack knickknacks. And you know, the fantasia where the two crows are. Um, uh, who are in blackface are singing a song about how I can see an elephant fly. I think probably most of you remember that. So here we are, it's at one o'clock and we're over at two, correct? So now I've tried to lay out a table here of uh, as deep as I think we can dive into the psychological impact of white 
noise and the law of gravity does and demands of the people to whom it's directed. Okay. We can't live that way because we're not there. We can't experience it like that. But I think what we can do through the history and by bringing together this appreciation right now as we turn into the new century, uh, end of the 19th, early 20th century, film, big newspaper, lots of different ways to be able to take the white supremacy that's always been there and distribute it and display it in very physical ways that are different than human relationships, but remind you of what those relationships were. I hope that's clear. Now, oops. Okay, there, something else is on the uh, screen here and I'm having trouble seeing myself looking around it, but <laughs> that's not your problem. I wanna move from that to move in very, very closely into what's going on down south during the period of time between 1865 and say about 1880. In the videos, it's even a closer examination, but we're gonna talk about two things. We're gonna talk about how African descended people, because we're not talking about voting anymore, we're talking now about day-to-day -day existence. How, when you've been living on plantations for generations, doing white men's work, of cutting and picking and fixing and all that. How do you go live on your own? We talked a little bit about sharecropping last time. The idea is the land's still there. Somebody's got to do something with it. Made the comment, I think I believe in the last presentation, that cotton's not edible. Somehow you have to get the <laughs> sustenance that's going to keep you going from year to year from what you grow in spite of what the cotton wants. Now, African descended people are not slaves anymore. I think we talk some about share. Planters own the land and they need to make money off the land or else they don't have any income. And the only way they can make money off the land is by growing stuff that they don't know <laughs> how to get out and plant it and tend it and do all the different things that need to be done. They've had black people do that and they're gonna to continue to have black people do that. And remember, we have abolished the slave but the master remains and the master want to remain as masterful as he possibly can. These are people that have been under his thumb in his opinion ever since day one and now they're not. The people who used to be under the thumb have to have a way to be able to survive and sustain themselves. They make a deal and it's called sharecropping. We've talked about it before. It's an annual negotiation between a black guy who doesn't have very much negotiating strength on his end, and a white landowner about how to get through the year. It has to do with lending money to the African American, uh, lending what? Basic things to the African American, uh, like plows, like mules, and like enough subsistence seed to be able to grow a garden and a lot of other things in exchange for using most of his labor and her labor and their labor, the kids do it too, out there picking cotton just like they used to. The point I'm trying to reference here is that it's a negotiation. People who used to believe that they could make the black people that they owned extensions of their will. I'm me, he's <laughs> not him. He's what I want him to be and he's gonna that's the master-slave relationship uh, in the mind of the guy who's deemed the master. That's gone. And that's a form of racial assumption and racial control and racial power that when it's gone, it creates a huge pool of uncertainty that people who are accustomed to owning black people had never experienced before. How do you negotiate with what you used to own? How do you figure out that this guy that you're negotiating with, if you don't negotiate with him this way, he's gonna go over to the next plantation and try and strike a better deal. He may be doing that right now while he's talking to me. Can you feel how different that is in slavery? You can feel in a deep way the foundation assumptions of human relations between owners and owned, black and white, crumbling 
once you get to sharecropping. Instead of seeing it as a substitute for slavery, which is a good thing to do, you can do that. You also have to see it as something that's deeply, deeply subversive of how masterful whites have their basic assumptions destroyed because who can negotiate except other human beings? It's a recognition of autonomy and a loss of control. Now, under those conditions, and this is really, really important to stress, it's not surprising that there's a Ku Klux Klan, right? Planters aren't being evil in their own mind's eye. They're being restorers of order as best they can do it. That's what they think about themselves. The legacy comes down to what happened in Mississippi where those three guys gunned down the jogger going down the street. He's out of place. He's not where he's supposed to be. So Ahmad Aubrey gets shot because he's using his autonomy. And that's a very extreme case of a hangover of the community that I've tried to describe. So that is certainly important in understanding the substructure of what we see in these media events and this media infiltration of daily life that we're talking about right now. I hope I'm making myself clear. There's lived experience at the center of this that involves eyeball to eyeball contact between black people and white people. And you have to have that going on at the same time. So the idea of making examples of black people at lynching by saying to black people, this is a sundown town and you can't be here any longer once the sun sets or something terrible is going to happen to you. All of that is based on the agonizing. I'm trying to be as, as far into the experience as I can be. The agonizing and terrifying experience that you don't control these folks anymore. You can do lots of things to coerce them. But this assumption that you control them ain't there. And so that's what's important to recognize when we move to the next phase of things. We're still on the ground. We're still in the period of time between 1876 and sort of at the end of the century. You've got African-American people, as I said in the videos, becoming peasants. And I tell you that peasants are smart people. They do a lot of good stuff that we don't do because they know how to survive under environments that we've lost a long time ago. A lot more resourceful, a lot more imaginative, a lot less involved in routine. And what, jacks of all trades, but masters of many, not so much. Peasantry are people that are not producing for the market, they're producing for subsistence and that kind of thing. So you have that, and at the same time, you have this bargaining thing going on, which leads in turn to the reestablishment of a form of slavery. This is another video. We're still in this period of time. The idea that you can re-enslave the free is something that I think a lot of people know a lot about nowadays that they didn't know about 10 years ago, which is that the 13th Amendment makes an exception for people who happen to be in prison when the 13th Amendment passes. I think I mentioned this last time and it's in the video. Uh, perfectly sensible idea, you don't want the Emancipation Proclamation to let everybody out of jail. Point is that the exception clause then allows former planters, the master remaining, or trying to, being able to charge people who are involved in contractual relationships with them for owing debts, for creating small criminal incidents, for being involved in one thing or another, no matter what it is, with the idea you're going to land in jail. And when you land in jail, if you saw, oh, brother, where art thou, you, you know what it looks like. These are people that are now slaves of the state. Their sentences are indeterminate. Their sentences sometimes are determined, but during the time that they are in prison, they are working entirely as enslaved people, no compensation, go out and do road work, get cotton. Biggest plantations that you can find that turn themselves in this direction are today's big modern prisons that sit in places like uh, Angola, big prison in Louisiana, it used to be a sugar plantation, still is a sugar plantation, or Parchment in Mississippi. Those were two big giant plantations, which 
after slavery ended, private owners turned over to the state who turned them back over to the private owners to act as contractors for prison labor, which then you could buy and sell at least all over the South. So in this tight, big framework of big cultural racism, we have as much coercion and as much trying to get people back to where <laughs> white masters were accustomed to remembering them as you possibly can. Okay, uh, I'm going to be able to do this just fine. I'm going to actually finish on time. Uh, now we move in to an even tighter period of time to end with. And these are the videos you can go look at if you haven't. The time that I'm wanting to tie into is the period of time between 1876 and 1877. Because this is where all these dynamics begin to come including the bigger dynamic, which is all involved underneath this sharecropping, is that those share, same sharecroppers can vote. <laughs> At least the males over 21 can. The same people that you're negotiating labor contracts with are people who are voting for other people for local office in your district. You see how it works? Lots of things going on. Well, in this period of time, take the big newspapers again. We are going to watch a huge act of racial violence being committed in a little place called Hamburg, uh, South Carolina in 1876. A big army of white guys led by someone who's gonna become the governor of the state of South Carolina pretty soon. His name is Wade Hampton. Invaded Hamburg because Hamburg was a place where the master didn't remain. As suffrage began to work itself out, as enslaved people were able to figure out how to put their own lives together, they began creating what you would call villages, not just sharecropping things, but things that involve other artisan skills, and being able to create and dominate certain local communities. And Hamburg was one of them. It's got a black city council, <laughs> town council, I guess you'd call it. It's got a black sheriff, it's got a black mayor. And there are a lot of African-American people coming in from the countryside to trade and do a lot of things with other African-Americans there. That is people way out of place, but that's hampered. And in 1876, a big army came in to wipe those folks off the face of the planet. Hamburg Massacre, 1876. Okay. Remaining time, 15 minutes, I'll try to explain to you what lies behind all that and how it attaches to the stuff that we've been talking about for the past little while. If you pick up one of those big newspapers that I was talking about in 1876, you'd see columns across the page, I'm replaying the video a little bit here, where as you read the newspaper, you read about this topic over here, this next one over here, this next one over here, this next one over here. And the newspaper becomes kind of a Rorschach test. And the guys who put the newspaper together on the front page know that that in these thick print columns over here in, well, let's do it just this way in 1876. Here is Custer's last stand. They're reporting on huge Indian wars that are going on out in <laughs> the West, which is our place right now, uh, against very large organizations of, of native people who have been in charge of a great deal of what we call the United States for thousands of years. Why are we moving these people out? Well, far as sure, but also big railroad rights of way. This is the age where the Transcontinental Railroad is only the spine of railroads going everywhere. Railroad uh, construction is construction is very, very taxing and demanding. That's why with the spur coming east from uh, uh, California, they import Chinese laborers to do the work. The whole idea of creating labor forces that they can even talk about as labor flows, like if the water you can turn on and off and move people around, all made up of Eastern and uh, Western European immigrants, white. They don't know they're white, but they're going to learn. <laughs> they think they come from Czechoslovakia. No, from no, Czechoslovakia, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
uh, or the Czech Republic, we guess we call it today. The idea is that one way or another, big, big people like James J. Hill and um, Andrew Mellon and um, Andrew Carnegie and uh, people like that are building these giant railways with huge rights of way. Mentioned in the videos about once you put all the rights away that the federal government gave away uh, along the line that these routes go, it's the size of New England. <laughs> okay, so you can understand why Native people are really, really upset and why the US Army segues beautifully from the Civil War into Indian Wars. That's column one. And part of this presentation is that red people lose everything. If you saw the video, you'll see a, uh, a, a picture of buffalo bones piled up as high as you can see. I'm not gonna talk about dead bodies or anything else like that. That used to be what native people worked with as a central part of their culture and political economy. Now it's being used to make bodies with the skeletons. The point is you read about anarchy, violence, red people, custard I stand in this column. Then you move over to this column and you read about the railroads. What do you read about the railroads? You realize that right now, after you've done reading that other thing, these are big reports of labor violence going on in major uh, traffic centers for railroads all over the country. That <laughs> these immigrants that you brought in aren't people who are fairly sophisticated about labor organizing because they've been doing their own society. And they know that they're being abused, they know they're being um, shortchanged, they know they're, they're um, working jobs that are basically labor exploitation. And they begin going on strike. And they begin involved with uh, ideas of being able to shut down the railroads because railroads are technologically very vulnerable. Always have been, always will be, always hard to run, always have to keep a lot of things on schedule. This is before their computers or any ways to be able to figure out where the traffic is going. It's a mess if anybody messes with it, which is what labor unions, beginning labor unions on the railroads began to do. Ethnic whites, and they know they're white because what happens to make these problems go away is that people like Andrew Carnegie and so forth bring in black strike breakers to make sure that the railroads run on time. They also use private armies in order to be able to simply wipe away these strikes and bring in the strike breakers. So you can see the racial violence and the labor violence all tied up together. And then in this other column over here, you have savage red people. You're reading all this at the same time. Then over in the next column, you're reading about nobody knows who's president. This is all in the video that I may have talked about before, but it's worth the reminder. We had an election in 1876 that involved uh, two people that you don't remember. One is Rutherford B. Hayes, and the other is Samuel J. Tilden. Tilden is the Democrat, Hayes is the Republican. Now remember, the Republican Party runs the South. They're the guys who passed all these amendments. They're the guys who need African-American voters in order to stay in power, explain that last time. These Republicans are absolutely vital to the <laughs> continuance of the promises of the 14th and the 15th Amendment for African-American people in the South and across the nation. Okay. So the party that brought you the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments is now in a contested election with Democrats. And what went on here was a period of time for practically eight months where nobody knew who was president. Nobody knew who it was. The reason why uh, can be understood perfectly well by Donald Trump's way of trying to steal the election the last time by fooling with the Electoral College. And the basic reform of the Electoral College that has failed so badly was legislation that was done after this crisis in the Electoral College happened in 1876. Going real fast, but I only have about seven minutes to go. So here we are, three states. Uh, this is what Trump tried to do in all the swing states and couldn't do it, was to put together groups of contested electors. Okay. In Oregon, in Louisiana, and in whatever state I can't remember, there's a big, big division 
of opinion about who won in the state, okay? Because the electors are appointed by the party that won after the election is certified by the state laws. Or, yeah. So the Democrats have their own slate of delegates. The Republicans have their own slate of delegates. And nobody can finally reconcile these conflicting claims so that either candidate, whether uh, Rutherford B. Hayes or Samuel J. Kelvin, has enough electoral votes to actually be the president. Boom. So, after you've read about red savages, after you've read about labor riots, by the way, the Europeans who uh, become white people uh, who are involved in this are seen as reds, as communists, as anarchists, as bomb throwers. There's a lot of other stereotyping going on along with what I'm talking about. I should have said that before. So now you read over here that the election's up for grabs. You don't know who's in power anymore. You wait a long time, you have a lot of anxiety. It's really, really hard to get up in the morning and read the newspaper all across the columns and you connect them. Just the same way we connect the environmental crisis together with inflation, uh, together with our drug epidemic, together with our pandemic. We put these all together and have a general idea of how the world is working or not and how we're gonna to respond to it. Well, in 1876, the final resolution of that election is in favor of Rutherford B. Hayes. And it's all done in a very complicated backroom way that took a guy a whole big book this big to be able to explain it. I won't bother you with it. The deal is the Republican electors are recognized if the Republican Party will withdraw its troops from the South. No more way of enforcing. 14th and 15th Amendment directly. They're still on the books. It's still illegal to violate them. But the enforcement mechanisms that would normally be there are gone. Hayes wins the election. And the next thing that happens, as soon as all that's done, is the Hamburg riot that I talked about, uh, the Hamburg massacre that I talked about. A minute ago. All of this uncertainty explodes across the South in lots and lots of different forms of violence against Black people because now you can do it with a greater degree of impunity than you could before. In the North, the idea that one way or another we have passed amendments, emancipated people, given them uh, uh, full legal citizenship, and given uh, Black males the right to vote, we've made them equal. Now they're on their own, they can do what they want. Meantime, in the broader culture, the clear emergence towards the beginning of the next century and then on into the 1920s and 30s are the films, are the narratives of the family being divided but coming back together again in a wonderful reunion, symbolized by the triumph of the Ku Klux Klan in the, um, in the film by D.W. Griffith. And by the time you stack all this stuff on top of itself, you can see how multiple crises feed on each other. It's nothing new to us. We're doing this right this minute and trying to make sense of the world and asking what autonomy, what choices, and what, <laughs> what moral responsibilities we have in a time when we really feel the Republic is slipping in a lot of different ways. So the point today is to put media together with on the ground, sharecropping, prison industrial complex beginning in the South, and the creation of the opportunities that will allow you to feel that you're reasserting control by founding the Klan, by wiping out Hamburg, by making sure that the master will remain and you will not have the kind of independent, renegade Black communities that Hamburg represented. Now it's uh, 25 after by my watch, Judy, and I'm gonna stop five minutes early. I hope that what I've done here is to give you a way to repackage the videos if you've seen them already, or if I've enticed you enough and you haven't seen the videos already to go back and actually look at them. Uh, this is a more telescopic way of trying to put them all together. So I hope I've been able to be a 
at least intelligible uh, to everybody who is listening. So your turn now. Okay, and it is the audience's <coughs> turn now. Um, we have a, a few questions in the Q&A line. Uh, we had so many questions last time that we didn't have time for. You can so do all that. Uh, so if you can remember your question from last time and we didn't get a chance uh, to address it, uh, we can answer it this time. So I will just start uh, from what we have here. Uh, well, okay, so the first remark, uh, let's say it's not really a question. Uh, hooray for teachers of history, even the <laughs> ugly part of history, maybe especially the ugly part. <laughs> I don't know if you want to comment on that or just say thank you, Jim. <laughs> well, I want to say thank you, but I also would like to reinforce the idea that if that's the way you feel, you got to get involved with your local school board and make it work. Okay. Uh, it, this is a time where everybody who's scared of a multicultural republic is trying to repeal the history that we all know and replace it with something else. Much like the history that I've been describing, uh, the romance of it, the melodrama of white supremacy. Okay, thank you for the compliment. Okay, next question. I'm actually going to broaden this a little bit because um, this question has to do with uh, economics professor Glenn Lowry from mm -hmm. Brown University. With um, and that's someone that I have been following a bit. Uh, the questioner says, uh, uh, Glenn Lowry said uh, at the U last week that there were more whites redlined than blacks. Um, and maybe you want to answer that question, but I would also like you to address a kind of a broader, uh, you know, uh, response to the analysis of conservatives, black conservatives like Glenn Lowry, and um, maybe not so conservative, but but certainly um, more centrist uh, people like uh, Jane or um, John McWhorter, yeah. uh, who have, have a real clear voice. Could you talk a little bit about well, first yeah, answer yeah. the question, but then talk about the other, if you would. Part of the <clears throat> this is a there are a bunch of difficulties that are involved in all this, and this is a really good time to bring them all up. Uh, so it's a worthwhile time to have this question. The fundamental question is, are we talking about black people or are we talking about poor people? That's really what this all comes down to. The idea of the relationship between race and class. Let me give you the most flagrant example of how you can go off the tracks with this. What if the whole business of affirmative action at Harvard is simply to let in a bunch of very privileged black people uh, who could afford to go there, who passed all the tests, and basically, or <laughs> um, asking, asking yourself, why are we so fixated on the complaints of middle class white? Aren't all poor people malserved by our welfare state? Aren't all poor people, one way or another, underserved by healthcare? The whole, uh, there's a guy named Adolf Reed, uh, who's very, very much unlike Glenn Lowry. Um, uh, because he's, he's way off on the left, but he hates the idea of even talking about racism. The whole idea is this is about class and the kind of stuff that I'm doing is something that props up capitalism. You have to have a critique of capitalism of one kind or another, or a defense of capitalism of one kind or another, which is sort of Glenn Lowry's way of doing it, in order to be able to say race is not all that important. What's really important, and you can see how you can make this argument, and it's a, it's, it's a mind buster. Um, when you think about the people who vote for the senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, people who are living in hollers and having uh, terrible times with everything from diet to health care to income to housing to everything else, compare those to those problems to the problems that you're seeing in inner cities, they're the same problems. Absolutely the same problems. And uh, if you want to be nasty about it, you say, well, the reason why these are free people, they should be able to lift themselves out of poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, doing things for them simply leaves them where they are and there's no, no progress gained. Or you can say, on the other hand, like Adolf Reed would say, well, let's just get rid of private property. 
<laughs> and uh, suddenly racial equality will come along with it. Uh, this is a really, really important debate. And I get nervous about my own positions on this because you can't spend all your time talking about one thing. If this had been a balanced presentation, I would have done a lot more talking about those labor guys who were doing railroads. And I'd be talking a lot more about Indians than I did. But you can see how you can make the arguments out of what sits at the margin of my presentation that tends to de-emphasize race and make other factors of impoverishment and manipulation and capital exploitation more important. Is that an answer? That is a general answer, but there was the specific question. Uh, Glenn Lowry said that uh, at the time of redlining, uh, more white neighborhoods were redlined than black neighborhoods. I don't know. Okay. All I know is that in Minneapolis, that's not true. That's not true in Minneapolis. Okay. All right. Well, we'll move on because we do have other questions coming in. Uh, I'm not sure what this related to, but somebody wrote, Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. Uh, that was a comment that, that was helping me to remember who we're talking about here. Okay. When, when I was losing names in the middle. Oh, okay. I'm going to rescue and they end up in the question columns. So. All right. Okay. Um, next comment has to do about the, the halftime show, the, the rap artists uh, yeah. at the Super Bowl. Uh, one thought this person says, that white box that contained the performers and also supported them could be viewed as a metaphor for the white box that contains the African-American expression of their culture. There were many symbols in that performance and the choice of costumes, staging, etc. Would you want to comment on the, what is it, the semiotics of the so halftime? Yeah, the halftime uh, show. Okay. <laughs> Who's ever posed that question, first of all, is really bright. Second of all, has got a lot of insight into what a performance is really all about and really ought to write an article or an editorial. I mean, mm -hmm. I saw it um, as something that emphasized white in order to make black look big. Didn't think about it as boxes and rooms. And maybe I should have. Uh, the question can't be answered. I mean, at least I can't. But what I can say, what I can say is the way she's posed the question, it invites a tremendous discussion of symbols and power and who controls them and why they're put that way. And you'd want to be able to get into the background of the show to see how much these guys and gals who are out there doing the performing did the designing. How much was the NFL involved with all this? How much choreography comes from the corporation? How much choreography comes from, you know, uh, Compton, <laughs> uh, in Cal you know, where rap sort of began? I can't answer the question, but when you get into spectacle, we're going to do a huge spectacle at the end of this set of lectures. It's going to be the Chicago World's Fair of 1896, 1893. Yeah, the year after 1492. And you'll see that an entire giant, um, yep, the white piano, Western European instrument performer in a white tuck playing African American. Yeah. See, you can, what we need to do, okay, Judy, you got to get us a grant. You ready? <laughs> you got to get us a grant to get us together after COVID goes away, and we're going to do a seminar where we're going to unpack the Super Bowl. Okay. <laughs> and we all get stipends, okay? <laughs> you got to understand, I'm not even a football fan, so I'm starting way behind the cur curve on that. <laughs> okay, I just, I just think that's a, that's a, well, what we do in academics, we say that's a problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a problem. It's something that invites being unwound and then rewound up again in different ways. It's really a smart question. No answer. <laughs> Okay. All right. Two sources I have say Tilden won the popular vote and the contested elector slates came from Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. I forgot about South Carolina. No. Okay. I, know, I thought one was Oregon. Anyway, however you saw it on Wikipedia is right and I'm wrong. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Um, what do you know about the events uh, that occurred in Tulsa? All for the next video. All for the next video. Okay. Yep. Uh, I know tons about it. Let me just say that the person at the University of Oklahoma, who's the chair of their history department, is an uh, African-American guy by the name of Carlos Hill. Now, this is a serious answer. Carlos came from a place called, I don't know, 96. That's the actual name of the town in South okay. Carolina to McAllister College, mm -hmm. where back in the day where you really did affirmative action, this was a guy with high gain and tons of problems and expression and reading and all kinds of things. He graduated, finished his PhD at the University of Illinois, wrote a wonderful book called Beyond the Rope, which is all a big study of how African-American uh, uh, people in the South contested lynching, fought back against lynching, something nobody's ever written about before. He it was in charge of the memorial for the um, Tulsa race war, they call it a race war, what it is, it's, a, it's an invasion and destruction of a community, Black Wall Street. Uh, he wrote the script basically that has become a comic book, a graphic novel, a lot of different things. His name is Carlos Hill spelled with a K. And uh, he's taught, all you have to do is look him up on the web and see what he's produced. And he's probably, he's just a miracle man from how he's been able to work all this stuff. And if you get on his website, you'll find out everything you need to know about the Tulsa. Uh, I'm so proud that he was my advisee and my former student. And uh, he's really started to become a hero to me. Ask Carlos, don't ask me. While we're on the subject of the Tulsa massacre, there is another question, maybe a more general question you would want to speak to. Um, how much benefit are depictions of the Tulsa massacre in uh, Watchmen, you know, the TV um, uh, series in Lovecraft Country? Or uh, what is the benefit, if there is a benefit? There isn't. Or let me go on, because I think the the, call, the questioner means more in general, depictions of events uh, um, through the prism of Hollywood. This questioner also talks about uh, Oscar nominated movies like uh, The Green Book or The Black yeah. Clansman. Um, I'm not familiar with the second one, but I think what he's trying to get at is, is you know, our are, is Hollywood's sort of prismatic view of, of these events of use, or is it? <laughs> okay, there's, the only thing that Hollywood wants to do is make money. Mm -hmm. And when it is confronted with actors, let's, let's go way, way back. And we'll start with, since he died just recently, Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. Whatever is acceptable to a white audience is going to work. And that level of acceptability can be a lot of different things. Um, but it ain't Spike Lee. <laughs> if you want to judge black cinematography, uh, you have to be able to see those kinds of production. Spike Lee has produced films that nobody will ever watch. I'll just give you an example. He's got one called Bamboozled. Has anybody ever heard of it? Nope. I've heard and of it. There you have. Bamboozled is a word all the time that Malcolm X used to use about how white people would bamboozle you all the time. And <laughs> it, the, the way he spoke that word became sort of iconic. And the plot of the, of the film is how blackface becomes so popular that all white people in America start to wear it. And how it becomes a giant moneymaker. And it's it's a giant takeoff and a really savage spoof of game shows, of Hollywood, of all kinds of different things. There's an element to move to a completely different quadrant that started in the 70s with uh, films like Shaft, uh, which are all black exploitation films. Mm -hmm. They're all with the idea of somehow showing the man being the black guy and at the same time being the badass. And 
fulfilling a whole series of mythical stereotypes that white people have and forms of satire that African-American males use to pimp black people. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this gets so complicated. Um, then you get people who are really great actors who happen to be dark skinned. Uh, who would be my Denzel Eddie Washington? Denzel Washington has the problem that he's been so overexposed that he can't play parts anymore because all people see is Denzel Washington. Well, uh, he just played Macbeth. <laughs> I know he did, but I saw him through all of that as being Denzel Washington, didn't you? Yeah, actually, yeah. I, I did. mean, yeah. you know, what you're doing is you're going in for celebrity. Mm -hmm. And if the, the idea that Macbeth is transgressive because Macbeth is black or, you know, you could have a queer Macbeth or you could have any kind of Macbeth that you want. Uh, the idea is that the transgression is the thing that makes the money. Mm. Uh, and, you know, in, in Glory, where uh, Denzel Washington plays this, this emancipated slave who's really militant, really angry, I couldn't believe him for a minute because he was Denzel Washington. You could see him. And except with his hair shaved off, he looked like Michael Jordan. And all of these things come out as stereotypes of something else which is not the same sort of thing that you want to be able to see in really good African-American film. The best way to look, a really great way to look at a standard for film is to see the film of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Because that stuff is really real. Or really, um, The Color Purple. Mm -hmm. I mean, Toni Morrison was in charge of making that happen. And the, I think if there's, a, if there's a theorem here, and I don't know if there is one or not, the theorem is the closer that the creator of the script is to the enactment of the film, if it happens to be a black author, uh, the better off you're going to be. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on because we do have more questions. Um, the next question, I uh, apologize, I, I am not familiar with this, and so I'm going to mispronounce this. The person says, I've been reading a bit about the Osoe massacre in 1920. It's spelled O-C-O-E-E, -E, and it's a place in Florida, I think. Uh, are you familiar with this? It says, voter suppression was so much more brutal a couple of generations mm -hmm. ago. Current suppression of the black vote is probably equally effective though. Uh, would, is that true? Do you agree that current suppression of the black vote is as effective as it was no. at the time of these massacres? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I don't believe that is because, uh, well, a couple of different things. First of all, uh, the kind of stuff we've legislated in the 60s is still in vague ways on the books. Mm -hmm. I mean, Civil Rights Act of 1965 is not entirely gone. Uh, second thing is that black urban politics in the United States right now is so, so well developed mm -hmm. that black urban machines, <laughs> like the kinds of things that, you know, give you a really lousy mayor in Detroit or Chicago, <laughs> <laughs> because it's all tied up with other forms of lots of different things. But the main point is that... <laughs> African Americans have learned in a way that it's taken generations of civil rights lawyers to do how to go to court and how to litigate. Mm -hmm. You could not imagine Stacey Abrams at the time that this voter suppression took place in Florida. Stacey Abrams is somebody who represents, you know, uh, just a huge renaissance of African American leadership in all kinds of fields. It's really crazy if people don't begin to recognize how much of leadership in the United States has been occupied by people who happen to have dark skin mm -hmm. and political good sense and a lot of ability to organize. And everybody who makes cliches about African-American women being the spine of the voting business, they're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is sort of a housewifely duty. I know somebody who is like this <laughs> in South Carolina. She's, a, she's an art teacher, but 
honest to goodness, if she were uh, politically politicizing all the time through her church, um, she couldn't have done that during Reconstruction, at, at the end of Reconstruction. She would have been suppressed completely from being able to do that. And the person who would have suppressed her from doing that would not be a white guy, it'd be her husband. Yeah. Because so, the male leadership isn't there either. Stacey Abrams has shown tremendous leadership capacity. She's been a real force for mm -hmm. uh, change. And yet she was not elected. She didn't win her race. So does Stacey Abrams represent uh, victory? Does she represent yeah. success or failure? Oh, false choice. <laughs> point is that, well, fundamental point is Barack Obama lost his first election too. Mm -hmm. uh, the second point would be that, that what you're doing through running for the Senate is developing tremendous exposure for yourself and creating a footprint for a foundation and social movement that you couldn't have done unless you ran. The third thing that you've done is that you have gotten yourself in a position where you've done a tremendous amount of gender imprinting on African-American politics mm -hmm. in a way that certainly Kamala Harris is never gonna do. And so my feeling is that being elected or not being elected is part of a bigger process of building leadership in through her and in a lot of other places as well. Mm -hmm. That's the way I would read it at least. Okay, next question. Uh, the questioner says, would you elaborate please on the impact of the things you were talking about on Native Americans? Sure. Uh -huh. Okay. Minnesota is the good place to answer that question because we're all sitting here right now. And I'd refer you to a book that is written by another one of my students, a uh, historian by the name of Mary Wingard, who's written a book like this. Hang on, I'll get it for you. Sitting right here, called North Country. And it's the history of Minnesota from the time of the establishment of native cultures in our region through the year 1864, 1865, okay? It's a beautiful book. It was commissioned by the state of Minnesota for the centennial of the states or whatever. And uh, she's a really prominent historian who did a beautiful book on St. Paul before that. And she started out as a 41-year-old secretary at McAllister College taking history courses. So you can do it. No such thing as aging. <laughs> it's just the next stage. Not too late for me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> American Indians lose everything. I put that in for a reason. In the battleground that we've just been spending all of our time in, suffrage, franchise, disempowerment, repression, that kind of thing, what if we were to consider that Minnesota had a civil war going on during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. That as a consequence of timber, railroads, huge immigration starting in about 1855-56, all of a sudden this backwoods place with too many trees on it, nobody's interested in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Suddenly there's all kinds of people that understand if you can get rid of those trees, there's no rocks underneath and you can really do stuff. And you can use those trees to build houses on the treeless prairie and it all works just fine. In the space of three years, the people who used to run this whole real estate for millennia were expelled from the state. The idea is that you wanna keep African descended people where you can see them. You got to have them around because they're very, very threatening people that at the same time you're dependent on for a lot of different things. That's what sharecropping looks like. That's what prison labor looks like. That's what slavery looks like. That's what McDonald's looks like. <laughs> if you want to think about it in a certain kind of way. But that gets into questions of class as well, right? Okay. So the battleground is a huge battleground where everybody stays where they are and continues to fight. 
Nobody takes any land away from anybody. It's a big political, violence, cultural battle in the place where everybody lives. The impact of all of this, uh, the people of Minnesota, the native people of Minnesota, is to turn them into exiles. To say, all of a sudden, you guys have to get out of here. We're going to hang 37 of you down here in Mankato mm -hmm. after an attempt on the part of a group of native people to try to finally hang on to something. And you know, they killed a lot of Swedish farmers and German farmers mm -hmm. and bloody savages and all that kind of stuff. But that bloody savage stuff is the antithesis of sharecropping. Mm -hmm. The idea is that this is land that you don't own. Show me your title. Well, we've lived here for a billion years. No good. We have a thing called the Land Ordinance of 1865. And the federal government finances its uh, operations by selling off land and by giving it away and by having people settle in it. That's how we make new states. So I'm a citizen of the United States and I'm coming here and I'm asserting my rights because when I go into a new territory, all my rights come with me. And you, the, the collision in cultures uh, between what's property, how it's used, uh, who benefits, uh, what, what it means to be part of a community is, is and the sad part is that in, in this big book that I just showed you for the first two thirds of the book, everybody had that figured out. There were all kinds of people who weren't Indians going in and out of this place. They were doing all kinds of stuff. They were trying to convert Indians into Catholics and they were doing stuff on the fur trade and all kinds of things are going on. There's a lot of race mixing because nobody knows anything about races back then. You create something that's kind of, kind of called a Métis culture that's a combination of French and English and native. And everybody sort of lives in this semi permeable membrane where they can just go back and forth being people recognizing cultural differences, but intermarrying all the time. Mary's book is an act of a horrible miracle because she shows you in 20 pages how all that turns into black, into red and white. Mm -hmm. And it's just terrifying to watch it because she's got all the documentation for it. Uh, that's the answer to the question, or at least my answer. It's a very big, very dramatic answer. All right. Okay. Well, um, let's see. We are uh, moving toward the end here. I, I think it's going to be kind of neck and neck. Are we going to make it to the end of our questions? So I will I'll give you a short answer. Short okay. answer. <laughs> All right. Please talk about the role of the U.S. Supreme Court in interpreting Constitution and amendments, especially the Civil War amendments, I guess the Reconstruction amendments, um, interpreting these amendments and uh, parts of the constitution to the advantage of corporations. So okay. an economic analysis of the Supreme Court. Okay, well, I got to do that along with the racial analysis of the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court's basic history is <laughs> undermining civil rights legislation. All this stuff comes up in the courts about what equal is and what equal protection under the law is and all that kind of stuff. And you end up with a whole series of decisions that end up with Plessy versus Ferguson, which is finally segregation is the national law of the land. But leading up to it is Supreme Court decisions that are dismembering it before it finally goes away. And you can see the same thing going on with the Voting Rights Act today. This Supreme Court is behaving like normal Supreme Courts do when it comes to adjudicating racial discrimination in voting. The big exception is when Thurgood Marshall is on the court in the 60s. That's the only time in American history that the court has been favorable to the expansion of citizens' rights across color lines. That's the first point. Second point is that the 14th Amendment gets reinterpreted, and this is where her question, or his question, is coming from, by being able to define uh, <laughs> uh, due process as applying to corporations. The 14th Amendment is interpreted as being able to see corporations basically as having the same rights as individuals. If you begin to do that, then there are a lot of actions that you can't take against corporations any longer because though taking action against them, you don't have any standing. You got to be a lawyer to understand what that is. You don't have a stake in the game because this 
this big thing called <laughs> Netflix is <laughs> just another guy. <laughs> That's yeah. a very crude way of putting it. But the idea that one way or another, the Supreme Court has always interpreted as much of the Constitution as it can to the idea of what one constitutional authority called creative destruction. The notion one way or another that the forces of the market have to break things up in order to be able to create new things. And when new things come together to combine more powerful things, the market will take care of it. And uh, creative destruction is, a, is a, actually a concept that's a, set up by an economist by the name of Joseph Schumpeter. But uh, it gets into legal terminology pretty early with the idea that the courts and the markets are friends through the 14th Amendment. That's a really short answer to a complicated question. Okay. All right. Uh, we've got a couple of comments uh, going back to the halftime show for the Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> right. uh, apparently, there were um, this, this, some of the uh, stage set was supposed to be uh, landmarks from Compton, California, mm -hmm. this person says, and that's, that Bruce Rogers designed uh, the stage set. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, do you know anything about that? Do you want to add anything to that? All right. In that case, because we're running out of time, let's just move right along here. Birth of a Nation, the movie, sounds similar in use and impact to the protocols of the elders of Zion. Both being both using untruths to perpetuate harmful stereotypes of a racial or religious segment of the population. If you agree with that, um, and then the question is, to what purpose? Why? How are how are things like Birth of a Nation and the Protocols useful? Oh, protocols of the Elders of Zion. Is, Maybe you should say what that is, you okay. know, just to make sure everybody is on board there. Well, God, this is just a wicked question. Because when you, we're talking about anti-Semitism written yeah. big time in a set of descriptions of what the Jewish religion does to itself and to other people that, you know, it's all about baby. In a set of czarist era forgeries. Yeah, about, yeah. yeah. Right. But, it, but it's rooted in mythology that goes way, way back into the Middle Ages. And you know, that it's, it, it's an excuse for the expulsion of Jews from England. Same mess. You, know, and you can go on and on and on with this. Anti-Semitism is it's got a logic, a life, a time of its own. And if you really want to compare uh, something to birth of a nation. Get a hold of Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, <laughs> yeah. which is the equivalent movie mm -hmm. for explaining Hitler in good terms, as D.W. Griffith did for explaining white people who oppress black people in good terms. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is not the place I don't think that you can make the comparison, because one is a set of mythic documents that gets put into a document. The other are two big pieces of celluloid that are done by cinematographers who are geniuses. They're just incredible in what they can do with the techniques. And if you look at, if you can stomach triumph of the will over here, and then grab another bag of popcorn yeah. and go over <laughs> here and do birth of a nation, you'll begin to see that the equivalency you're looking for. But you've got to have a lot of guts or you've got to do a lot of reading or something. It's a great question, but you have to compare comparables. Yeah. Okay. I think we are out of time. Alas, I'm just going to read one last comment, uh, which I stand corrected here. This person points out, uh, this was not Stacey Abrams' first race. She is has been successful because she served for many years as a leader in the Georgia legislature. So I stand corrected on that. And I'm going to um, say thank you very much to one Jim more thing. Stewart. Wait, yes. One more thing. Okay. Last four videos. You know, I'm trying to dodge around so that I do the kind of presentation for people who have seen the videos and thought about them a lot, and people who haven't had time to do the videos. I'm going to start. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop where I started. 
the more confidence I have that the videos have been seen and at least reflected on briefly, um, the more you're going to get from me. <laughs> so watch the videos, everybody. Yes, thank Meanwhile, you. thank you very much, Jim Stewart. Thank you, behind the scenes, uh, Grayson and uh, Grayson yes. Simmons. And uh, we'll see you all next week for the final episode in this series titled Consequences, the Rebirth of a Nation and the Birth of a White Empire, 1896-1924. See you then, and uh, uh, thank you so much today.